Hello, I am Hannah Donnert with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Che enjoys bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnerships, calls, and webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's Che EDC Strategies Partnership webinar, which is titled Key Characteristics Approach, Female and Male Reproductive Toxic Hazard Identification. Our moderator today is Jerry Heindel, founder and director of Commonweal's Healthy Environment and Endocrine Disruptor Strategies. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We'll get to as many comments and questions as we can and during the Q&A period. For those of you who called on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slide. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 45 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Jerry. Okay, thank you. Welcome to our webinar on the key characteristics of male and female reproductive toxicants. We'll hear today how a group of scientists applied the key characteristics approach first used to define chemicals that cause cancer to male and female reproductive hazard identification. Our speakers today were key authors on the two publications. Our first speaker is Ulrika Luderer. She is a professor and director of the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health and chief of the Division of Occupation and Environmental Medicine in the Department of Medicine at the University of California, Irvine. Dr. Luderer's research focuses on the mechanisms by which toxicants and ionizing radiation disrupt ovarian function, accelerate ovarian aging, and cause ovarian cancer in adults and subsequent generations following exposure during development. She will present the data on the key characteristics of female reproductive toxicants. Our second speaker is Dr. Gail Prinz. She is the Michael Reese Professor of Urology and Physiology at the University of Illinois at Chicago and co-director of the Chicago Center for Health and the Environment in the School of Public Health. She is also the director of the University Andrology Laboratory. Her basic research focuses on estrogen actions in the prostate gland, including the influence of early life exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals on prostate cancer risk later in life. She will present the data on the key characteristics of male reproductive toxicants. Thank you both for joining us today to present these groundbreaking publications. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Luderer, and when she finishes her part, Dr. Prinz will just jump in to continue. Okay. Dr. Luderer, you can start. All right. I'm trying to advance my slide here, and it's not. <laughs> oh, wait, now it did. <laughs> All right. Sorry for that little technical glitch, and thank you, Jerry, for the, uh, the kind introduction and for inviting uh, Gail and me to speak about the key characteristics of reproductive toxicants. I wanted to first show everyone these uh, links to the two commentaries that were published in Environmental Health Perspectives recently, um, uh, on which we were members of the working groups and co-authors of these papers. So anyone who's interested in learning more after the webinar can go to uh, look at these papers. I wanted to start out with a little bit of background about the process of chemical risk assessment for reproductive toxicants. So chemical risk assessment for reproductive toxicants begins typically with hazard identification, asking the question, is this agent a male or female reproductive toxicant? 
if the hazard identification indicates that that is the case, then the next steps are dose response assessment, asking the question, what health effects occur at different exposure levels or at different doses, and exposure assessment, which asks the question, how much of the agent are people actually exposed to? All of these steps are then synthesized within the risk characterization, which attempts to answer the question of what is the extra risk of reproductive health problems in this exposed population. So the component of risk assessment to which we feel the key characteristics are currently most applicable is the hazard identification step. And that's what we'll be focusing on today. So the chemical hazard identification or assessment it really represents a bottleneck in this uh, chemical risk assessment process for reproductive toxicants. We know that there are tens of thousands of chemicals in commerce but very few of those have been evaluated for female or male reproductive toxicity. Hazard assessment for human health risk assessment relies most strongly on animal toxicology bioassays, so in vivo animal studies, as well as if it's available human epidemiological data from epidemiological studies. Now, both of these types of studies are expensive and time consuming, and that is a large reason why so few chemicals have um, been evaluated um, using these methods. In general, less emphasis has been placed on mechanistic data, and that is what the key characteristics approach was really designed to address. So this concept of key characteristics was originally, as Jerry mentioned, pioneered for carcinogens by an international agency for research on cancer working group in 2012. And that group of experts identified characteristics that are commonly exhibited by established carcinogen. And the idea is then that these characteristics could be applied to begin to identify whether other chemicals that have not been evaluated could also be flagged as potential carcinogens. So the approach provides a uniform, uh, this is a uniform approach for searching, organizing, and evaluating mechanistic evidence for carcinogen hazard identification. And indeed, it is currently being utilized by IARC in their assessments. And if you want to learn more about that, this is a publication that was recently published. In addition, in 2017, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine of the United States issued a report recommending that the key characteristics approach be expanded to other endpoints, including reproductive toxicity. So one of the members of the IARC working group, Professor Martin Smith from U University of California, Berkeley, and Lauren Zeiss of the California Environmental Protection Agency Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, organized a workshop at Berkeley in March of 2018. And this is a photograph of the working group participants who were experts in female and male reproductive toxicity and endocrine disruption. And the goal of this workshop was to review the key characteristics approach and determine whether the, the convened experts thought that it could be applied to female and male reproductive toxicants and endocrine disruptors. And we did come to the conclusion that, that yes, it could be. And we also formed three working groups at this workshop that were formed to continue working together. And the commentaries that I showed you and our talk today relates to the basically the output of two of those working groups, the male and female reproductive toxicant working groups that continued working together over more than a year time after the, the initial workshop by teleconference. And these were really iterative processes in which the initial list of key characteristics that we had drafted at the meeting um, in our work groups were refined based on discussions of the entire work group. And then also the work of subgroups that were focused on developing and refining specific cases and example chemicals, bringing that back to the whole group, discussing it, and then back to the subgroups, et cetera, in that iterative process. So I wanted to take a moment here to make, a, an, I think, an important point, which is that key characteristics are not apical endpoints, which may lead to the question, what are apical endpoints? When we speak about apical endpoints, we're speaking about those types of endpoints that are measured in typical guideline studies, for example, guidelines uh, for reproductive toxicity testing of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development or the US Environmental Protection Agency. And these include endpoints such as estrocycling or menstrual cycling, endpoints that can be measured in animals and some of them also in human epidemiological studies, reproductive organ weights, 
the macroscopic and microscopic evaluation of reproductive organs, various developmental endpoints pertaining to reproduction, such as puberty onset, uh, development of the external genitalia, as well as pregnancy endpoints in females like pregnancy rates, uh, implantation rates, birth weights, et cetera. Male-specific apical endpoints similarly include reproductive organ weights, structure of the reproductive organs, sperm evaluation, including sperm counts or concentration, quality endpoints, uh, pubertal development, uh, and other developmental endpoint, as well as sexual behavior in males. So the key characteristics really move upstream of these apical endpoints and are looking at early changes that can occur in vivo after exposure to a chemical, or uh, even endpoints that can be measured in in vitro assays, either primary or um, or in cell primary cultures or cell lines or other in vitro assays. So these are the 10 key characteristics of female reproductive toxicants that our work group of, uh, identified. And I'm going to go through those now quickly and, and say a little bit about each one. So KC, as I'll be referring to them, number one, is that alters hormone receptor signaling, alters reproductive hormone production, secretion, or metabolism. So for example, this can refer to a chemical that is either an agonist or an antagonist for estrogen or progesterone receptors, or a chemical that alters the synthesis of reproductive hormones, their secretion or their metabolism. And this includes not just the steroid hormones, but also the, the number of peptide hormones that are critical for regulating female reproduction, including luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, inhibin, activin, uh, prolactin, oxytocin, et cetera. KC number two is chemical or metabolite is genotoxic. And this is true of a number of well-established female reproductive toxicants, for example, some of the anti-cancer drugs, one of which I'll be talking about, as well as ionizing radiation, so that either the parent chemical or one of its metabolites interacts uh, with, with DNA and uh, causes DNA damage. And this can lead to DNA damage responses, which can result in death of the cell, can result in cell cycle arrest, or if the DNA uh, damage is not repaired uh, in mutagenesis. KC number three induces epigenetic alterations. So the, the epigenetic field has really been um, ballooning in recent years and has been an intense area of interest as it relates to female reproductive toxicity. So epigenetic modifications refer to uh, things such as methylation of DNA, histone modifications, which include also methylation as well as acetylation and others, and microRNAs. And these types of epigenetic alterations when they occur uh, during prenatal development of the female reproductive system have been shown to result in effects on the function of the female reproductive system later in life, as well as heritable changes that can result in alterations or female reproductive toxicity in subsequent generations as well. KC number four causes mitochondrial dysfunction. So we know that the number and quality uh, function of the mitochondria in the oocyte is critically important indicator of oocyte quality. And we also know that the many, if not all, of the mitochondria in um, mammalian organisms are contributed by the, the oocyte. So this is an important target of reproductive toxicity in the female. KC number five is induces oxidative stress. Some of the chemicals that are, are genotoxic mentioned in KC2 also as a result of their metabolism result in oxidative stress and generation of reactive oxygen species or ROS. Another way in which a uh, chemical can target, can um, induce oxidative stress is by down-regulating antioxidant defenses in cells of the female reproductive system. KC number six is alters immune function, and this refers to, to either hypo function or hyper function. For example, in, during ovulation, we know that there is an, in, um, an influx of white blood cells, leukocytes, into the preovulatory follicle, and also that prostaglandins are very important in uh, ovulation. And indeed, it's known that if uh, w animal models or uh, women are treated with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, this can inhibit ovulation. Number seven is alter cell signal transduction. And this refers to cell signaling pathways that are 
activated, for example, by luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone in the granulosa cells and theca cells of ovarian follicles, including protein kinase A signaling and AKT signaling, as well as other intracellular signaling pathways that can be perturbed by exposure to female reproductive toxicants. KC number eight is alters direct cell-cell interactions. And here we are uh, speaking, focusing on cell-cell interactions that are critical to female reproduction. So some examples uh, are the, the first, the binding of sperm to the zona pellucida of the oocyte and fusion of the membranes of the sperm and the oocyte during fertilization. Another example is the interaction between the cilia of the oviduct and the oocyte, which is required for oocyte pickup by the oviduct and then transport of the oocyte down the oviduct. Number nine is alter survival, proliferation, cell death, or metabolic pathways. And again, many female reproductive toxicants have been shown to alter uh, pathways having to do with cell cycle, proliferation, uh, cell death, including apoptosis, as well as autophagy. KC number 10 alters microtubules and associated structures. So it's well known that spindle toxins that interfere with microtubules can disrupt the progression of meiosis in the oocyte, as well as then leading to aneuploidy. So that's a quick review of the 10 reproductive uh, cases of female reproductive toxicants. And now I'm going to talk about three examples that we highlighted in uh, the commentary. And these are example toxicants for which we have abundant epidemiological and or, and actually for all three of them both, in vivo toxicology data that, that demonstrate female reproductive toxicity. And we explicitly chose toxicants with differing modes of actions um, as examples. And so these are diethylstilbestrol, cyclophosphamide, and TCDD, tetrachlorodibenzodioxin. So first, cyclophosphamide is an anti-cancer drug. It's on the Proposition 65 list of known female reproductive toxicants, and from decades of use of clinical use, it's known that treatment of women with cyclophosphamide causes temporary or permanent amenorrhea and early menopause due to ovarian follicle depletion. Cyclophosphamide exhibits at least five of the KCs. Uh, listed first is KC2. So my, cyclophosphamide is metabolically activated to genotoxic metabolites including phosphoramide mustard, which is thought to be the active anti-cancer metabolite. And this results in cultured neonatal mouse ovaries and increased double-stranded DNA breaks in the oocytes of primordial follicles. Cyclophosphamide exhibits KC number five. When a uh, human granulosa cell line or oocytes, uh, mouse oocytes are cultured with cyclophosphamide, this increases generation of reactive oxygen species and results in oxidative DNA damage. It also exhibits KC7, and this kind of the, the example listed here is that in vivo treatment with cyclophosphamide of mice leads to increased phosphorylation of ovarian AKT and its downstream target, FOXO3, and this is thought to be involved in the destruction of follicles in the ovary. KC9 is also exhibited by cyclophosphamide. Culture of granulosa cells with cyclophosphamide Increase, induces apoptosis in the cells, and also when mice or rats are treated with cyclophosphamide, increases in apoptosis in the granulosa cells of growing follicles are observed. Finally, KC10 is exhibited by cyclophosphamide. When oocytes are cultured with cyclophosphamide, the um, microtubules are disrupted and meiotic spindles are disrupted, and this disrupts meiotic progression. The second example is diethylstilbestrol. Diethylstilbestrol was used to prevent miscarriage and unfortunately was not effective in that regard, but daughters of mothers who were treated during pregnancy with DES develop vaginal adenocarcinoma and malformations of the uterus, cervix, and vagina. Diethylstilbestrol displays at least three of the KCs. The first one is, the, is KC1, and this is because diethylstilbestrol was actually developed to be a potent synthetic estrogen, so an estrogen receptor agonist, and it binds and activates, in particular, estrogen receptor alpha. It also displays KC7 uh, in that in utero uh, treatment of mice with diethylstilbestrol or exposure of cultured human endometrial cells to 
diethylstilbestrol alters HOXA10 gene expression. And HOXA10 is a gene that's very important in the patterning of the female reproductive tract. So the differentiation of the Mullerian duct into the oviduct, uterus, cervix, vagina, upper vagina. And this process is disrupted uh, by DES. KC3 is also, also exhibited by DES in that treatment of mice during prenatal development alters DNA methylation, including of the promoter of HOXA10, as well as causing uh, changes in histone acetylation and histone methylation in the developing uterus. And it's thought that these epigenetic effects are driving the changes um, subsequently in expression of genes such as HOXA10. Our last example is 2378-tetrachlorodibenzo-p-dioxin, or TCDD. And it's known from studies in numerous uh, different rodent species that, that in utero exposure to TCDD adversely affects female reproductive system development and function, leading to uh, delayed puberty, decreased um, estrocycling, decreased fertility, and a number of other outcomes. TCDD displays KC1. It alters estrogen receptor signaling, so it interacts with, um, the, uh, with the estrogen receptor um, promoter, altering um, signaling, not the TTCD itself, but the AHRTCDD um, uh, um, combination, that's its receptor. And this interferes with estrogen receptor signaling. It decreases estrogen production in luteinized granulosa cells. Uh, cultured, and its developmental exposure to TCDD decreases the expression of progesterone receptor in the uterus and, and uterine responses to progesterone later in life. TCDD also displays KC3. Developmental exposure to TCDD results in hypermethylation of the uterine progesterone receptor promoter in the females that were exposed in utero, as well as their granddaughters, so causing transgenerational effects, which which are thought to be driving the decreased uterine expression of progesterone receptor. It also displays KC6, altering endometrial immune function, actually promoting an inflammatory-like um, response in endometrial implants in a mouse endometriosis model. It displays KC7, disrupting multiple cell signaling pathways in cultured monkey endocervical cells, as well as human luteinized granulosa cells, um, including um, epidermal growth factor receptor and, and MAP kinase signaling and other pathways. It also displays KC9, altering protein levels of cell cycle regulators um, in endocervical cells from monkeys that were treated in vivo with TCDD. So with that, I will turn it over to Gail, who's going to talk about the key characteristics of male reproductive toxicants. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me get this up to full screen. So our group uh, were, uh, got together, we worked independently. Um, and um, when we look at our different key characteristics that were derived, um, for male reproductive toxicity, there is some significant overlap, no surprise, with um, what was found in the female. We did look at uh, molecular and mechanistic pathways, and we also looked at some cell-based um, events, and we based this on uh, looking in the literature um, at what was common in a number of male reproductive toxicants that had been studied in great depth. Um, to find commonality and to identify different key characteristics in male reproduction um, that were being altered uh, by the uh, chemicals, the toxicants, uh, which could eventually lead to male infertility. And so I'll quickly describe these. In number one, we looked at um, agents that altered the germ cell. So the sperm um, cell during development, migration, um, and uh, differentiation into the uh, germ cell itself, the process of spermatogenesis, um, both during development as uh, well as continuing it during adulthood. Um, the germ cell function, so in this case, sperm motility, sperm activation via capacitation, acrosome reaction, its ability to penetrate the oocyte, 
or agents that might uh, drive an increased rate of apoptosis or cell death in the germ cell. The second one that we considered, a KC, KC2, would be agents that altered somatic cells, particularly somatic cells um, in the region or within the male reproductive tract, but they could also include cells outside of the male reproductive tract that then indirectly impacted male reproductive function. And so these could be the uh, Sertoli cells within the seminiferous tubule wherein the germ cells mature, spermatogenesis occurs. They could be the Leydig cells that produce testosterone in the testes, the myotubule cells, um, uh, important for uh, sperm uh, exit from the testes. These could be somatic cells within the X current duct, such as the epididymis, where spermatozoa uh, mature, the vas deferens, where uh, they exit the male reproductive tract, the uh, accessory sex glands, the um, prostate and seminal vesicle, as well as the external male genitalia, anything that would disturb their normal development or function, such as hypospadias, erectile dysfunction, um, could certainly adversely impact male reproduction. Um, and then there could be age, uh, cells outside of that as well that affect hormone production, et cetera. Um, the third case C would be um, agents that might alter the production and level of reproductive hormones. So this is very similar to what Ulrike said in the female, altering the production of um, the steroids within the testes, testosterone and estradiol, as well as steroids within the adrenal gland, uh, which does make a lot of uh, androgens and secrete them, as well as the pituitary, the hypothalamic pituitary, um, gonadal axis, FSH and LH, GH and prolactin, also influencing male reproduction. Case C number four is altering hormone receptor levels and function. So increasing or decreasing their expression, uh, blocking their activity, activating their activity in um, inappropriate times. Um, oh, going back to KC3, that just reminds me another thing with reproductive hormone levels um, that we also have to consider is agents that affect the metabolism in the liver, um, such as atrazine does, or their um, excretion um, by the uh, kidney. So the receptor levels, and if we look at genotoxic function, very similar to what Ulrike described in the female. In the male, it's particularly important because the spermatogonia, the sperm cells themselves, do not have a DNA repair mechanism. So once um, genotoxic events take place, driving uh, single-stranded or double-stranded breaks or resulting in aneuploidy, um, these cannot be repaired. Uh, Agents that, KC6 would be agents that induce epigenetic alterations. There's evidence that's emerging over the past 10 years or so that this really can adversely impact male reproduction and um, alter uh, uh, activity transgenerationally. And so there's some uh, really important data showing that these activities can take place being transmitted through epigenetic modifications in the germ cells themselves. Inducing oxidative stress, increased accumulation of reactive oxygen species can in turn drive genotoxicity. But it's important to remember that reactive oxygen species have a normal um, function within the germ cells and trigger certain necessary cell signaling pathways. And so modifications too low or too high in that arena, um, separate from DNA damage, can also alter reproductive function. And finally, a KC, similar to the immune uh, disturbances, we um, had our last KC, we came up with A of inducing inflammation. Um, this can be chronic inflammation uh, or acute inflammation. Inflammation, it turns out, is a root cause of a lot of diseases. Um, in the male reproductive tract, for example, we know that macrophages normally play a very important role within the testes, cross-talking with Leydig cells. So there needs to be macrophages in that environment for normal balance. 
um, but um, too many or too few can produce an imbalance. Um, it can also drive a number of cytokines, reactive oxygen species, which can alter cell signaling pathways. Um, it can uh, lead to scarring of the reproductive tissue, obstructive azoospermia. Um, and so KCs can, uh, agents that induce this particular process could adversely affect male reproduction in that aspect. So um, we, I'll just show you a few examples here. Uh, one that we have a lot of data on is cadmium. It's a known male reproductive toxicant. It can cause temporary or permanent male infertility to do, due to direct testicular effects. It's been shown to alter sperm motility and function, induce hormone changes and other factors. And when we interrogated what was known and aligned them with the KCs, we identified seven of the eight KCs, and we might get to eight even with more research. And so KC1 is increasing sperm cell death and altering sperm count and motility, reducing them. For KC2, it's altering Sertoli, gap cell, Sertoli cell gap junctions um, between each other, as well as with the germ cells. Um, and it leads to lytic cell cytotoxicity. KC3, it's decreasing pituitary LH, FSH, and prolactin levels, and ultimately this leads to decreased testosterone production by the testes. KC4, it's um, inhibiting or reducing lytic cell LH receptor. Um, both KC5 and 7 in the testes um, it drives ROS-dependent DNA damage, and it induces significant testicular inflammation. The only KC that we couldn't identify evidence for with cadmium was epigenetic alterations, and that's always a possibility with additional research. So what um, uh, we did with, uh, with cadmium, because there was so much evidence, we find that, that the KCs can guide um, a mechanistic network framework as well. Um, so we can see how cadmium up on, up on top here can lead to male infertility down at the bottom through a number of different um, pathways that may crosstalk with each other or may not. And it leads to what really exists in nature, which is a very complex regulatory network that does control male reproduction. For example, we can see induces inflammation, um, leading to oxidative stress, which can be genotoxic, leading to germ cell uh, development, uh, development and function disorders. Um, so uh, this can really uh, be organized. The KC information can be subsequently organized at a higher level um, as well. I'll show a few other, other examples, some that have less evidence. Um, phthalates, um, uh, plasticizers, there's evidence in human for an increased time to pregnancy uh, due to reduced male factor fertility. Uh, the strongest evidence is for DHP and DBP, and effects are shown with both fetal exposures and in adult men. So when we look how we can organize this evidence for impacting male infertility, um, into the KC's approach, we identify that it um, affects KC1, germ cell degeneration apoptosis, it reduces counts and motility, and results in poor morphology. In KC2, um, it too influences the Sertoli germ cell interactions, drives Sertoli cell apoptosis, but at the level of the external genitalia, um, during development, it can increase the incidence of hypospadias and cryptorchidism, and one of the markers for this um, exposure to is a decrease in anogenital distance in newborn males. Uh, KC3, it decreases testosterone levels in adult men, and KC6, there's some evidence in mice now um, that it alters sperm non-coding um, RNA, so that might give you some information on a more mechanistic level for how these um, uh, agents are working. So we can see looking at this that the picture is not complete, but the evidence is really pointing in the direction of altered male fertility and identifies research gaps or areas that might need more research to get a full picture. 
Um, one last example would be 4-methylbenzylidine -ben camphor. I trip over that, 4-MBC. This is an endocrine disrupting chemical. It's an ultraviolet filter that's used in sunscreens. The data there is more limited. Um, it is shown to increase sperm hy hyperactivation motility in humans. Um, and this is a, a neat assay, the Katzberg Channel assay, um, that one can do in vitro. It's essential for calcium mobilization across the sperm um, plasma membrane, uh, which triggers the acrosome reaction. It also triggers sperm hyperactivation. And this needs to be done in a temporal manner as the sperm are approaching the oocyte. Normally, it's triggered by factors that are released in that environment. But environmental chemicals, if they trigger these activities prematurely, we can have defects in uh, the ability to fertilize eggs at the time that they're actually there. The acrosomal enzymes may no longer be available. The hyperactivation motility essential to penetrate an egg um, may have been lost. KC4, there's evidence that um, it influences ER beta in vertebrates and ecdysone receptor in aquatic species. Also in aquatic species, there's decreased hatching um, and evidence, clear evidence for transgenerational effects, although there's not direct epigenic epigenetic alterations that have been documented, it points in that direction. It points to an area where more research may be very productive. And there's also evidence that it induces oxidative stress. So I just want to wrap up again why this particular approach for organizing data might be important. Um, we believe that the KCs provides a starting point for identification, organization, and analysis of mechanistic data that informs whether chemical or a, a chemical or group can cause adverse reproductive effects. It focuses on known organs and systems um, that uh, are positively associated with reproductive function. It, it um, can provide a format for the development of targeted literature search strategies for chemicals using a combination of KC terms for specific endpoints. It can be used to develop literature inventories and also KC networks for a chemical as for a high or higher order understanding of what's going on, as I showed you in the case of cadmium. It can guide prioritization of data poor chemicals for further evaluation. It can identify data gaps and therefore drive, uh, uh, identify research needs in certain areas. It can help in the development of new assays, assays for toxicants. The new Katzper assay is a wonderful example. And importantly, KCs can also inform the development of the adverse outcomes pathways if that organizational scheme is being utilized. Um, I, the, the main organizational and classification systems that are in play today um, are the uh, mode of action classification, which describes a functional or anatomical change that results from the exposure of an organism to the substance. And um, MOA was actually um, expanded in more recent years or decades into an adverse outcomes pathway. Um, this, as with the MOA pathway, links in a linear way existing knowledge along one or two, one or more series of causally connected key events between two points. So typically a molecular initiating event is identified and of course an adverse outcome. And these can occur at a level of biologic organization. And so these two class classification screens are widely used by risk assessors and others evaluating evaluating databases. Um, but we believe that there may be some limitations in these particular approaches, and I list them here. This is adapted from slides from Martin Smith, who's really been driving the KC approaches. Biology is not linear. It's influenced by feedback mechanisms, repairs such as DNA repair, um, hormonal positive and negative feedback mechanisms, background exposures, susceptibilities across species or with even, in, even within species across 
um, individuals. And it's a big network of systems that's more complicated than the MOA AOP approaches might allow. There are multiple ways to arrive at the same conclusion, the causal pie concept um, that might not be included in a linear model. It's also limited by the current understanding of the disease process. As Bradford Hill noted, what is biologically plausible today depends upon the biologic knowledge of the day. And so we might not know key pathways and therefore um, avoid going in that direction, um, but that would come out later um, with new knowledge. Key events are supposed to be quantifiable, but in reality, they may be impossible to measure. And so this is an example of Rothman's causal pie, and it shows that um, you can get to a sufficient cause for particular diseases by multiple combinations of causes. Cause one is using A, B, C, D, E, and if there's a complete focus on that, it might overlook that you could get to sufficient cause by some common uh, factors A and B, but also unique ones um, H, G, and F, similar with cause three A and C, but F, I, and J. So there are a number of different combinations of uh, root causes that might be driving a disease that might not be completely captured with an MOA or AOP approach. Also, MOA or AOP approaches may be incomplete or wrong. Um, there's the example of DEHP um, with carcinogenesis that was brought forward uh, by uh, Ursin and Corton when a, um, a pathway that occurred in rodents but was not applicable to humans um, misled some of the identification. We also tend to focus, we're all very, very biased, and we focus on favorite mechanisms um, that may introduce bias or popular mechanisms. Epigenetics is popular right now. There's the emerging microbiome. Uh, back in graduate school, we were all focused on cyclic A and P, which kind of shows my age. Um, but there's these particular focuses which are introducing bias. And finally, um, how many validated endpoints, um, adverse outcome pathways might be needed for 100,000 chemicals producing hundreds of adverse outcomes in different ways. It becomes very complicated and almost overwhelming. The important thing about a KC approach is that it does not require a risk assessor to guess the mechanism. It remains more agnostic. Um, uh, Martin stresses that mechanistic hypotheses in science are beneficial because if your hypothesis is wrong, you modify, if you test it and it's wrong, you modify the hypothesis and get closer to the truth. But if your mechanistic hypothesis in uh, base uh, risk assessment is problematic, actually, because if you are wrong, you may have made a bad risk of decision that cannot be easily changed. It may have caused medical harm um, if something was missed, or it could uh, cause economic harm if it was misinterpreted and there was not actually the risk that was thought to be there. So to just summarize the key characteristics of known human um, toxicants provide a knowledge-based approach to organize and evaluate available data of other chemicals um, for evidence of reproductive harm. Reproductive toxicants tend to act through multiple mechanisms, producing the hallmarks of compromised human and animal fertility. As such, a KC approach can incorporate complexity and avoid potential bias. KC is agnostic. It does not require an a priori hypothesis of mode of action or a causal linkage, linkage to an adverse outcome, which may be an unavailable for thousands of chemicals. Having one, this is very important, having one or several cases does not conclusively identify a chemical as a reproductive toxicant. So it has to be used correctly. It aids the risk assessors in working with reproductive experts in prioritizing chemicals for additional toxicity testing or evaluation. It can identify data gaps 
and pinpoint areas requiring additional research so it can inform funding agencies. Similarly, gaps in mechanistic data need not hamper identification of a chemical as a reproductive toxicant. And finally, KCs may be useful in conjunction with the data science approach to predict toxicity and identify chemicals requiring further study. So I'll close with identifying the members of our two teams who worked for a year and a half on these um, KC approaches and publications. Um, there are two people who are common to both, Lauren Zeiss of the California EPA and Martin Smith at UC Berkeley. And for the male reproductive um, uh, team, uh, Xavier Ar Arzuanga, um, I always trip over his last name, my apologies to him from the US EPA, really drove what was taking place in the male reproductive uh, team. So at that, I'll close our, our presentation. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Prince. Now it's time for our Q&A session. You, will, you may type your questions to the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window. We'll get to as many comments and questions as we can. I'll pass it off to you, Jerry. Okay, thank you. So the first question uh, is, is this uh, approach gonna be applied to other health endpoints? Do you know anything about that? Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, sure. I'm happy to jump in. So currently there is a working group uh, on endocrine disruption that is also um, uh, writing, a, has written a publication that will be, well, a, a manuscript that will, uh, I think, hopefully be published soon. And there are several other working groups, I think, also being um, put together for other endpoints. Um, I think one on neurodevelopment, um, yes, as well as some others. Cardiovascular, okay. I think, as well. Yes. Okay, great. Another question has to do with the, the sex ratio. Is altering the sex ratio a, a key characteristic that you missed? Hmm. Well, let's think about that. Well, you would go back mechanistically, I would believe, and see the root cause of um, what would cause this sex ratio to be altered so that could be through influences in hormone levels, um, influences in receptor signaling. Um, uh, uh, there would be a number of mechanistic events that could be identified that actually drive shifts in sex ratio. So I do believe um, that's more of an apical um, outcome and not as much as a key characteristic. Okay. So the thing that struck me is really the a difference in the approach, it looks like, between the people who did the male and the female. Um, the, the ones, the people who did the male looked at more physiological and endocrinological endpoints. And the people who did the female were more general endpoints. For example, it altered male hormone levels and the production of, of hormone, le hormone levels. That wasn't in the female one. The uh, female said immune in general, but the male said inflammation. And the, the male one said alters germ cell functions and it didn't say anything about the different ovarian cell types being altered and stuff. So it's, I'm kind of wondering about that, that maybe you guys didn't talk enough together. <laughs> well, I can say for our group, we were, the, the key thing to keep in mind is that we were viewing these different key characteristics as occurring in cells or tissues of the female reproductive system. So not in necessarily in any cell or tissue. Um, and we were really trying to focus on mechanistic endpoints that are early changes uh, as opposed to apical endpoints that would be measured in a typical in, in vivo um, bioassay. So, um, so, and we also wanted to be 
very, um, provide broad coverage for the female reproductive system, although much of the data has focused, you know, or study, many studies have focused on the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian access, and we access, we, and we did, one of our, our first KC is alters hormone receptor signaling, hormone production, you know, secretion or metabolism. So I think that is very similar to the two male KCs that deal with hormones, but we wanted to make sure that we included other aspects of the female reproductive system, such as mammary gland development and function, you know, uterine function, et cetera, things that maybe we would, that would, uh, we, we didn't want to focus on just one um, part of the, of the female reproductive system. We wanted this to be broad. Yeah, I would just add to that, that uh, we, we did work independently. We had two common people, uh, but they tried to not tell us what to do and uh, to allow us to uh, look at the evidence in front of us and uh, identify uh, root causes of what was going on. Uh, so we did wind up with more of a cellular approach and we do have mechanistic um, data as well. Um, but um, I think both of them work and both of them encapsulate um, all the reproductive toxicants that we could identify from the literature studies. Um, so they all lead to the same thing. Sure. No, I agree. They, they, they both work. I was just struck by yeah, the, so was I. the difference a, a little bit there. So one of the things that I always wonder, so now how, I'm not quite sure how these will be used. Some of the stuff I can see it can in, inform research gaps and provide some mechanistic networks, but for hazard ID, Mm -hmm. Does it make a difference if something affects one KC or five? Well, actually, it, it could affect one and could be a complete reproductive toxicant. It could affect five and still have um, uh, uh, have it not confirmed with subsequent studies, I would say. Um, the presence of one um, or eight doesn't, is not the definition of adequate evidence. It's the depth of that evidence and the knowledge that's garnered from. So for example, if we could identify a chemical that the only thing that was known um, was that it was wiping out spermatogenesis and we did not have evidence that it uh, mechanistically of how it was doing it by altering hormone levels, et cetera, et cetera. If that evidence was not available, but it was wiping out sper spermatogenesis and the humans or the test animals no longer had gametes, then I think that we could reasonably conclude it's a reproductive toxicant. Um, but there could be ones where other things were perturbed um, mechanistically that wind up not to be a reproductive toxicant, particularly if they're more general. Um, I'm not really sure. I can't think of an example where several of them come up and then aren't a reproductive toxicant, but this is a way of data searching, collecting, and organizing data. And so I think the key is that it does not require a mechanism. It's agnostic, and it's a way of organizing data um, as one is doing a literature search and um, coming up with the evidence for a hazard assessment. Well, Ricky, do you want to yeah, add to yeah, that? And I, and I would just add exactly as one is, I, I agree that it can be one or it could be many and one, one should not assume that uh, a toxicant for which one KC is identified is necessarily less likely to be a female reproductive toxicant than one for which all 10 say were identified necessarily. Um, but I would also add that for each of those KCs, if one does a literature search, an another important aspect of then evaluating that the literature is how consistent for, you know, within each of the KCs, you know, is the evidence. Maybe there are studies that looked, you know, at a similar endpoint and came to and had different results. So it's obviously going to be very important to evaluate the literature that the literature search that's searches that are performed using the KCs to organize the searches, um, you know, what, what the outcomes of, of those studies were. So there's still just doing the search obviously is not enough. The literature has to be critically evaluated as well. Okay. 
there's a question about the slides, and let me just say that the slides are available on the CHE website where you look up this webinar. And the last question, uh, I think it has to do with, if we have these KCs now, does that really um, help us start a conversation with our doctors about toxicants by putting them under these kind of key characteristics? Does, does that help a doctor at all? I know that's a, a, a difficult question, but it's one that came up. Yeah, over key, my well, point is I mean, no. I think in, in general, I mean, one of the things that, you know, um, that is often challenging if a patient comes into the clinic with concern about a particular exposure and whether that might be a reproductive toxicant is, you know, as we discussed at the beginning, there's very few toxicants for which we have human epidemiological data or chemicals in general maybe that haven't even been identified as toxicants, or even animal bioassays uh, for, for most of the chemicals that people might be exposed to. And so there, you know, in that sense, this might be an approach that would be helpful to clinicians in trying to um, counsel someone about exposure to a particular chemical for which there is no in vivo animal data or human epidemiologic data, it sort of provides a way of looking at whether there are in vitro studies or mechanistic studies that might point to this being a, a potential reproductive hazard. Yeah I, would, yeah, I would also add not so much for answering the doctors, but there are so many chemicals where there's no evidence for reproductive toxicity because that has not been evaluated. Um, but for example, the chemical may have been shown in another system uh, to really interfere with mitochondrial function. And um, since my, the mitochondrial function is, is so critical in both the oocytes and spermatozoa, um, that if there's clear evidence that it's interfering with mitochondria and other cell types, one could then ask the question, well, wait a minute, it might it also be a reproductive toxicant and, and use that information to start looking into an area where previously no one ventured. Um, so it can drive research on a particular chemical into the reproductive arena um, if uh, some of the KCs are being hit, but there's no clear evidence in the reproductive system for it. Okay, thank you both very much for those great answers. And I'll turn it back now to Hannah. Great, um, we are approaching the end of our webinar today. A video recording of this webinar will be available on the CHE website soon. Tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a link to the recording. CHE's next webinar will take place tomorrow, September 19th, and is titled Climate Change and Heat, Health Effects, Adaptation Strategies, and the Benefits of Mitigation. In addition, CHE is holding another webinar next Tuesday, September 24th, which was titled Disrupting Cancer, Systemic Problems, Systemic Solutions. To learn more and to RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events and more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank you, Dr. Prince and Dr. Lutter, for taking the time to talk with us today, and Jerry for your excellent moderation. Thank you for joining us and have a good day.